Hello, I'm Barry Daniel, and this is the podcast of the Middle Way Society. Our aim is to encourage a universal approach to living a more integrated, ethical life, avoiding dogma or any appeal to authority. My guest today is the renowned economist and academic Norina Hurst. She's been described by the Observer as one of the world's leading young thinkers, is the author of several best-selling books including The Silent Takeover, Global Capitalism and the Death of Democracy, and The Debt Threat, How Debt is Destroying the Developing World. She's the Honorary Professor at the Centre for the Study of Decision Making at University College London, and she's here to talk to us today about her latest book, Eyes Wide Open, How to Make Smart Decisions in a Confusing World. Hello, Narina. Welcome to the Middle Way Society podcast. Thanks so much for having me on, Barry. Well, could we start, Narina, by you telling us a bit about your background and to what extent personal circumstances prompted you to write the book? Mm. So I'm an economist who has spent most of my career advising uh, presidents, prime ministers, uh, heads of organisations and corporations about big decisions that they have to make, strategic decisions, economic decisions, political decisions, business decisions. Uh, But about seven years ago, I got really sick and I had to make big decisions myself about what to do, which doctor to trust, whether to have surgery or not, what treatment to follow. And as I was going through that process, and as I was going, in fact, even before that, through the process of just trying to figure out what was wrong with me and trying to work out which doctor to listen to, I started thinking about how even though I'd advised a lot of people on big decisions, I hadn't thought that much about the process of decision-making, about how it is we make decisions. And so uh, in between MRI scans and CT scans, in between being ill and getting better, I started really digging into the academic literature on decision-making, not just in my field, economics, but also in psychology, in neuroscience, um, in history, in anthropology, trying to piece together what it takes to make really smart decisions. And when I got well, I went all around the world interviewing some of the smartest decision makers out there as well, trying to piece together how we can make better decisions when it matters. So what would you say is, is the main question you pose in the book, do you think? I think the main question I pose is how in a world of information overload and data deluge do we become masters of our own destiny? Okay. Um, Your other books uh, have to, to some extent, a a political dimension. Would you say this one has one too? I would, definitely. I think this book is political as well. It's just political in a much more personal sense. So it's about politics as empowerment, empowering us so that we don't need to blindly follow authority or experts or others, empowering us so that we can be, um, have real agency ourselves. Okay, so let's jump into the book itself. How how did you organise the book thematically? Well, I really wanted to write a book that actually gave people very practical takeaways, because, you know, sometimes you read a book and it's really interesting, but then you think, well, what do I do or how can I improve my life having read this? Or So I thought you know, I really wanted to help the reader be able to take something out of each chapter. So each chapter has a clear um, message and a clear set of kind of tips and steps woven in it. Uh, and I thought that would be the most useful way to structure all of this really interesting information. So there are uh, 10 chapters in each chapter is a step, a step towards being a smarter decision maker. I've thoroughly enjoyed the book, Narina, and um, you know, within the limits of time, we don't have time to look at all of these, but maybe we sure. could just unpack a few. So, for example, um, why is it important to challenge experts? Well, you know, as I discovered on my own journey, and I'm sure some of the listeners and viewers will have experienced themselves, Experts can get things wrong. In fact, there was research done in the United States where they looked at doctors and um, doctors' diagnoses, and they found that doctors misdiagnosed one time in five. Wow. One time wow. in five. 
um, which is really quite a high number. I mean, I'm not saying, of course, don't go to your doctor if you're sick. But what I'm saying is don't necessarily just follow their advice blindly. It's really important with experts to do your own research, to confront or, and engage with your expert with your eyes wide open, informed and with questions to hand. I mean, I also, as an economist, of course, as well, I'm all too aware of the failures of experts too. I mean, there was a tiny handful of us who um, who predicted the global financial crisis, uh, but most of my colleagues, you know, were talking about how safe the global economy was right up until when it blew up in 2008. And if we look at big geopolitical events over the last um, few decades from the oil crisis of 73 to the um, tearing down of the Berlin Wall to the rise of ISIS. None of these have been predicted by intelligence experts. So, um, so experts need to be treated with caution. Um, again, I'm not saying never trust them, but I am saying don't trust them blindly. Yeah, so, for example, if if you're going in for surgery, obviously that person is, is going to have hopefully the requisite amount of expertise. But but do your research, ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, you know, if you can get a second opinion, if you are not that good at figuring out the um, research that you're reading, who in your network might be able to help you. Maybe there's somebody in your community um, who might be able to help you get your questions ready. Yeah. Um, and also ask for help. Again, this is something one has to do um, wisely, but you can use social media and Facebook, um, for example, as a way of getting additional information. Sure. When my book came out, um, you know, a woman wrote to me and told me her story that she had had a very rare tumor diagnosed in her neck. She was in America. And where she lived, the doctors said that there was absolutely nothing that could be done. And she found a Facebook group of sufferers with this very rare condition and got in touch with them and found out that there was a medical trial happening um, in a different part of the U.S. and, and went there and is now wonderfully um, cured. So, again, you know, not everyone's experiences are going to be the same as yours. If you have a migraine, don't think just because somebody who has a who's talking about a brain tumour starting from a migraine is going to be you. Uh, you know, there are lots of thinking errors you can make here. But I am saying don't, um, don't ignore the possibilities that we now have to get better informed with much more ease. Sure, yeah. Well, you just mentioned that person there who managed to, um, uh, to gain access to material on, on, on the web and that co-creation is something you really espouse. Um, could you just expand on that a little bit more? Yes. Uh, I think we're living in an era in which top-down hierarchical um, authority is no longer powerful and where instead a more distributive leadership where um, those at the top of organisations or society are working together with those throughout um, in order to co-create better solutions, innovations, creations, uh, actually ends up being better for everyone. So, um, you know, whether you're co-creating solutions at work with uh, colleagues who are have job titles which are far less grand than yours, but actually these are the people who are on the ground and may have some really good insights, or whether you are trying to solve a problem together with um, a group of people online who are also deploying their abilities to do that. Whether you're a Japanese teenager co-creating with other teenagers, one of Japan's most popular pop stars who is a hologram called Hatsune Miku who's been co-created by fans. Um, they create her songs, they style her clothes or whether you're, um, I don't know, a company co-innovating a new product with your customers. I think we're increasingly seeing the value of um, distributing 
leadership, production, and and seeing it really bear fruit. Um, obviously, though, for some people, challenging experts can be quite intimidating. Have you got any advice there, how, how that can be addressed from both sides of that situation? Well, um, the research shows really clearly that those experts who, the ones who sound really overly confident, and the ones who are who act incredibly sure of themselves, those are the ones who are most likely to get it wrong. So if you're confronted with that sort of expert, you know, the one who looks at you really snootily and says, well, madam, you know, I, I know what I'm talking about and you don't, um, those are the ones actually where your alarm bells should be ringing. Um, so don't allow them to don't allow them to intimidate you um, and try and get try and go to your appointment with someone else. Um, you know, when I was sick, I was really lucky and that my husband came with me you know, to pretty much all my appointments, you know, to so try and try and see if there's somebody, a friend or a relative who can go with you. So you're not alone. Um Again, this is, you know, with good doctors, it isn't an, at all an adversarial relationship. Good doctors want your input. Good doctors want your thoughts. Good doctors, you know, want to explain what they're doing to you. So, um, so I think you know, you should feel that you should allow yourself to question and not allow um, someone, you know, however grand their title or their position, to make you feel small and stupid for asking questions and um, trying to be better informed when you have a big decision to make. And, you know, this is true whether it's your doctor or your lawyer or your bank manager or your financial advisor, I mean, all of the, or your accountant, you know, all of these people, um, sure, they have, you know, years of training that you won't have and experience, but if they're not answering your questions... Um, they're probably not the right person to be with. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. To what extent do you think our education system is geared to encouraging children to be experts? Um, well, you know, the education system is such that there is a um, kind of steady process of narrowing one's interests and subjects that one studies, um, you know, to the point that often after the age of... 16 you may only have been studying very very few subjects if you're still at school so our education system is one that narrows um you from quite an early age presumably with the idea that this is going to lead to greater expertise but i'm not sure that that actually works um uh and i think um so i think you have that going on within formal education but at the same time nowadays you know when you think about how children and teenagers the world in which they're living this digital technological world it's a world of search it's a world of sharing it's a world um of social media and google and um so kids and teenagers today have tools um at their fingertips to become informed um with an ease that we never had. My hope is that, you know, they become smarter as a consequence. The danger, of course, is that um, they are lazy, that they only look at the first thing that comes up on a Google list when they search for a term, that they um, pay inordinate attention to a rumour that's circulating um, on Twitter. So, you know, I think nowadays what really needs to be core to education is um, is a real education around critical thinking and um, where students and school kids need to really be taught how to think smartly themselves so that they can navigate this world and benefit from it because there are loads of potential benefits if you get it right. Yeah. You do sound a note of caution a couple of times with the internet, um, especially with social media, that in many ways it has a tendency to connect us only with people who confirm uh, what we already believe, that, you know, leave it into confirmation bias. Um, um, so how, given it, you know, that it's, it's universality, how can we get around this? You're absolutely right that we uh, we tend to be drawn to information that echoes 
what it is we already think. In fact, when we get that sort of information, we get a dopamine rush, similar to as if we'd eaten chocolate or had sex or fallen in love. So we are really drawn to information that echoes our pre-existing beliefs. And when you even think about who people follow on Twitter or the people they're friends with on Facebook, they tend very much to be pe like people like them, same background, same age, same socioeconomic group, even the same color, uh, same gender. So um, so this propensity, um, it's known as homophily, to be drawn to people very much like us, is problematic because it means that we risk only hearing echoes of our own thoughts and beliefs rather than um, challenging ourselves with different divergent perspectives and points of view. And so, and this is true on social media, but not only on social media, because we can do this in our own lives as well. And for example, there have been studies done in offices and you see that people are more likely to ask for help in international offices um, of people from people of the same nationality. So it's, so it's a tendency, a human tendency that we have to be wary of. Um, which is true on social media as well as off it. And what about factors like stress and lack of sleep? How badly can they affect decision making? Very badly. Um, it turns out that um, our emotions really affect our decision making. So if we're anxious, we become much more risk averse. If we're upset, we become much more tunnel visioned. If we're happy, we're more trusting and more generous. Um, so um, it's not just our emotions that affect our decisions yes if we haven't slept President Clinton talks about how the worst decisions he ever made in office were when he hadn't slept and there's research that shows if you go a few nights sleeping just four or five hours a night it's as if you're making decisions drunk uh, food, a lot of research about, about eating and decision making fascinating research done in Israel with judges they looked at why judges granted parole. Was it because of the ethnicity of the applicant? Was it because of their gender? Was it because of the type of crime? And then the single biggest determinant was whether the judge had recently eaten. <laughs> yeah, and it's incredible that there were vast differences between if you went before the judge, just before they'd eaten or just after. It was literally a difference between a 0% chance of getting parole or a 65% chance. Wow. Through the process of researching your book, you spoke to many people who had a good track record of decision making. Was there anything that really stood out that they all did? Yes, there was one thing that all of them did. Um, it was a real lesson. All of them actively carved out time to think. Right. Many of them put it in their diary, and these were busy people. Um, they put it in their diary. You know, some of them put in their diary Project X so that their assistant wouldn't schedule something in and thought it was very important. Some of them put TTT, time to think. Um, it's not necessarily time that they sat in their office looking at their screen thinking. For some, it was time at the gym that they designated for some it was time on the drive to work for others it was time when they had a walk but they actually consciously carved out time to think and interestingly this wasn't just you know business people who were doing this even the best emergency room doctors i spoke to the ones who had the best track records they said that even in that terribly tense setting they consciously breathed. They consciously carved out that beat, that pause to think, to reflect upon the choice they were potentially going to make, the life and death choice they were potentially going to make so that they had that pause, that moment of reflection. You've talked about um, reflection and critical thinking. Um, um, gradually, more and more schools are starting to introduce practices such as mindfulness and, and, as you say, critical thinking and philosophy into the curriculum from an early age. To be a better decision maker, how important is it not only to understand, you know, these strategies we've talked about conceptually, but, but to also cultivate um, a sensibility of scepticism and provisionality through such integrative practices? 
I think very important, and um, and there's and there's a vast body now of academic literature, hard science, to support practices like mindfulness, like meditation. Um, there's fascinating research done with um, Buddhist monks where they um, gave them there's a kind of very standard exercise that we do economists when we have people in a lab and we're looking at whether they're making a good financial decision and um, and it turned out that the people who made the best financial decisions in this lab setting were Buddhist monks and the researchers were interested why this might be and they looked at their brains and they realized they scanned their brains with um, functional MRI scanners and they realized that um, the part of the brain that notes emotions was particularly advanced. If you have a practice, a meditative, mindful practice, which is essentially about noting your state, yeah. um, it turns out this really helps you make good decisions because we already know that emotions can lead you astray. If you're a mindful decision maker, it seems to serve as a kind of emotional thermostat and you regulate your decision making. In relation to this, what is your understanding of the Middle Wayne arena and how, how might that relate to what we've been talking about today? If by the Middle Way we're talking about not being rigid in our beliefs and not being wedded to one, um, one way of doing things, if by Middle Way it's about not being fixated on plan A, but being willing to consider plans B, C and D and change tack when necessary, then I would say that in a world as complex, as fast moving and as challenging as ours, um, my way or the highway is completely the wrong strategy. The middle way seems much more suited to our times. Yeah, well, that's the middle way for me, Narina. <laughs> uh, what is your greatest hope for the book? Um, I hope is that people will read it and really find it useful for when they have big decisions to make, decisions about their health, their wealth, their financial security, their relationships, that when they have big decisions to make, they'll know that they have a resource to hand that could actually help them make smarter decisions. Oh, that sounds great. And, and my last question, if people wanted to find out more about your work how would they go about it if you want to find out more about my work um i have a website www.norena.com that's n-o-r-e-e-n-a.com or you can um, connect with me on twitter on at norena hertz um and if you're interested in getting um, the book you can get it on Amazon or at your local independent bookseller Smashing. well uh, I would highly recommend the book I thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you today Narina and a real pleasure oh thank you so much Barry you can find out more about Middle Way Philosophy at www dot middlewaysociety dot org